Um, okay, so uh, just to introduce myself, um, I am a, a cognitive scientist by training. So I began uh, working in psychology and then moved more towards the sort of neuroscience side of things. Um, and really the focus of my research um, over the last few years has been on neurodevelopmental conditions, uh, things like autism and Down syndrome and lang uh, language difficulties in kids, dyslexia, that kind of thing. Um, and I guess over the last few years, I've become sort of increasingly frustrated with the state of research and the way that we do research. Um, and I guess that's partly that is uh, sort of generic to the field of psychology. So I think you know, psychology has really been the sort of ground zero for the replication crisis that is affecting science. So we, we now know that um, these problems are sort of fairly generic across uh, the scientific spectrum, um, but it really began when people started realizing that lots of psychology studies didn't replicate, even when we thought that they were, uh, you know, pretty solid, pretty solid research. Um, but there are also a number of problems that I think are more kind of germane to uh, the, the kind of more specific research that I do in uh, in the sort of clinical side of cognitive research. Um, so at the beginning of this year, I co-founded Frankel Open Science, uh, which is a really a sort of collaboration between researchers um, on the one hand, like myself, uh, and uh, sort of people with more of a background in uh, tech. There's my co-founder is Pete Godbolt, who's been working in blockchain and and development for for like sort of four or five years. Uh, so that's well the the blockchain side at least for four or five years, which is relatively speaking a long time, obviously. Um, and so one of, one of the things that we're really thinking about is you know, trying to solve, solve problems. And there's been lots of great discussions over the last couple of days, but one kind of comment that really sort of struck out for me was uh, something that Carmen said uh, yesterday when, you know, what, we want, what, we will, what we're trying to do is build tools that make it easier for researchers to do good research, to do open research, uh, to get the best value from the efforts that they're putting in. Um, and, you know, what what lots of people are trying to do is build tools, right? So building cool tools. Um, but the strategy that we don't want to do is just kind of build tools and, and then just hope that the scientists uh, will come along and use them. And as Colin mentioned, you know, different scientific fields have different needs. Um, so really what we're trying to do is develop uh, solutions to problems within this fairly narrow field, but then doing it in a way that then we hope sort of generalizes uh, to other fields that we can then sort of work with. Um, so what are the problems that we, we're facing, particularly in this sort of area of cognitive science with sort of clinical applications? Um, so so one, one of the sort of driving forces for me starting this idea was um, this idea that you know, the tests that we're using to assess patients and uh, people with different uh, conditions um, in a cognitive way, it's a really sort of outdated model. Lots of, uh, it's, a lot of it is done with pen and paper tests. Um, and they're really expensive. It can cost like thousands, literally thousands of dollars to buy these tests, and then you have to pay for the bits of paper that you're writing on each time you use it. Um, it's really inefficient because it's pen and paper, and then there's lots of like opportunities for human error. Um, and it also, it's kind of inaccessible for lots of different populations. So working with kids with autism, I found that that was, um, you know, lots of the tests that we use, they, they perform really poorly, but that's just because um, you know, they find it difficult interacting with other people. Um, but also accessible in terms of the fact that to administer these tests, you need to be really highly trained. Um, and so that if you live in like a remote community or uh, somewhere that doesn't have services of psychologists or uh, speech therapists and so on, you just can't get assessed. So we wanted to develop applications that make all this easier. In the broader scheme, there's also the idea that you know, if we were trying to make sense of conditions like autism, we need large data sets. Um, and really, most of the research that's been done to date has been severely underpowered. Um, and so we need collaboration between lots of different partners, uh, lots of different researchers, people in, in the sort of clinical space. And if we're going to do that, then we also need the infrastructure for sharing the data, for uh, making sure that it's secure, um, and, and it's be all being done ethically. So really, this is this is the kind of problems that we we're, we're trying to solve. Um, so as Sonki mentioned, um, we've we've just received funding from the Wellcome Trust for a small sort of 
pilot application that we're building. This is uh, working with uh, a clinical neuropsychologist, uh, Professor Greg Savage, who's an expert in dementia. Um, so this first app is focusing on memory abilities in dementia, although the, um, obviously, in, in our sort of diagram or our animation, um, this is using a child as, as an example. But the idea is that the first step of the application is that researchers collect data using uh, the application. No, nope, wrong way. Um, and instead of the data sitting on the iPad or then being transferred to someone's hard drive, it's automatically and securely archived um, in cloud storage initially. Um, and that's, that's done, uh, it could be lots of different places. It could be somewhere like Figshare or Open Science Framework. Um, and that allows us to build into the data, data uh, collection this, uh, this sort of process of data archiving, which then makes it easier to share the data. Um, and obviously, uh, that means that then the researcher has the ability to share that immediately with collaborators within the, in the team. And so none of this involved blockchain so far. Um, but the, the blockchain comes in when we um, uh, look at the payment for this. So instead of paying thousands of dollars, you pay tokens. Um, so you play, pay Frankl tokens each time you use these applications. And what that then means is that as you're collecting the data, um, there's already a record of the fact that that data has been collected that goes immediately on the blockchain. So we're calling it metadata. By metadata, like literally just meaning data about the data. Um, so it would be pretty limited. So just uh, you know, the uh, the uh, who it is that's uh, uh, collecting the data, um, and information about where the data has been stored. But obviously, if the data is still kind of uh, secure and un unlocked, you can't actually get the data itself, and there obviously wouldn't be any uh, uh, identifying data at that point. What it does mean, though, is that this metadata is immediately available to the public. Um, so anyone can interrogate the, the blockchain, look at who's collected data with these applications, so that there's, there's a record of all the data that exists. And then the final stage would be um, at the point of uh, publication, or at, at whatever point it makes uh, sense to share the data more openly, either publicly or um, to uh, you know, the, the, the scientific community. Uh, and, and that, again, would be uh, situation-specific. So the, the idea is that at this point, at any point, uh, the researcher can unlock the, the, the data. It makes it easy to share the data instead of having to sort of search around on their hard drive for the data. Um, they can just change the access privileges to it. Um, and then the final part is that as a, a reward for sharing your data openly, uh, you get a refund of some or potentially all of the tokens. So, um, Oh, and, and initially, the idea is that we are building these apps like we're doing with this Welcome Trust grant. Um, but the idea is that the infrastructure that we're building around it, we can then uh, integrate with other applications that other, other researchers or other app developers build. Um, and as I mentioned, we're starting with this sort of fairly narrow focus um, on cognitive assessment tests. Um, but we think that in the longer term, this may be a model that might apply to other fields of research. So just to reiterate what's happened in this sort of scenario, um, so we've made it easy for, for researchers to share their data. Um, it's allowing us to build standards for the data and metadata into the application rather than forcing researchers to kind of do this all independently. Um, at MozFest, which I attended last weekend or the weekend before, losing track of time, um, there, there was a big discussion among psychology researchers about um, developing standards uh, that uh, could be used across uh, like lots of different fields of research. And it's all fairly straightforward, but it takes time and it's kind of not the kind of thing that researchers are going to do um, automatically. So, so we're making that all easy for them. We're providing a public record of the existence and location of the data, so it makes it findable. Um, and it's important that, you know, when we're thinking about the replicability problems that we're facing, a lot of it is because of selective publication of data. So a lot of data is collected and then not published. So um, at the very least, we're, we're, we're providing a record of all the data that has been collected, not just the data that's been uh, published. Um, and one thing we're thinking about is you know, including within that meta, uh, metadata on the blockchain the hash of the de-identified 
data. Um, and, th and then we can start thinking about how we can create a sort of scientific supply chain from the data as it's being collected all the way eventually to the what's coming out in the paper. Um, and also we're adding uh, incentivization, so there's an incentive to share the data, even if the study isn't published. So if you collect data and then you, you can't get the research published, you still can essentially get your money back or your tokens back uh, by sharing that data, and that might be useful to other people. Um, and, and also there's an incentivization incentivization to share your sort of code or your applications that you're building as a researcher for collecting data um, and, and potentially any other analysis software. Um, so you, you also get tokens uh, um, in return. Um, and, and importantly, when we're talking about incentivization, you know, these are tokens that their prime purpose is for collecting data. So we're not incentivizing people with tokens that are exchanged for money, we're incentivizing them with tokens that allow them to do more research. And we think, you know, if, if you're trying to incentivize scientists, what you want to incentivize them is, is the ability to collect more data and do more science. Um, so just finally, I want to talk about um, a concept that we talk about a lot at Frankel. Um, this isn't mine. This is uh, this is, uh, comes from uh, Pete, uh, my co-founder, and uh, another guy he's working with called uh, Tim. And they talk a lot about in incremental decentralization. So um, this is the idea that, you know, the end goal for a lot of what we're trying to do might be uh, full decentralization of research. Um, and there's lots of cool ideas, but it's going to be really hard to jump all the way there in one step. And so what we need to do is, you know, work with uh, technology, like centralized technology that does already do a good job. So things like Figshare and OSF um, already exist. And so it makes sense to work with those. Um, and eventually we might move towards uh, things like IPFS. Um, uh, as, as a you know as, as the next step but we want to take it one step at a time and the other th the other part of it really is you know trying to remove the friction points so if you want people to be using these we want them to make it easy for them to get into using cryptocurrency tokens um, and that's not a straightforward thing to do um, a few years ago Pete uh, tried to persuade me to get into Bitcoin uh, when Bitcoin wasn't wor wasn't worth what it is now, um, and I didn't because it took me so long to try and figure out how to create a crypto wallet. So um, one thing that we've, we've worked on and that we now have, and, and you can actually, I'm gonna talk about this tomorrow at the Steps workshop, is the uh, Frankel Google powered, oops, sorry, the Frankel Google powered wallet. So uh, this is something that we think is, is pretty, pretty cool. So instead of having to go through all the rigmarole of creating a wallet, you, um, can literally sign up and create a, a, a wallet uh, and an Ethereum address that you control using your Google account. And uh, it's, it's quite clever how it works. Um, I don't have time to explain it, but I'll talk about it more tomorrow. Um, and essentially, uh, it takes two minutes to click and then you have an Ethereum account and, uh, sorry, an Ethereum address and a Google account. So if you want to know more, um, come to the workshop tomorrow. Um, and I guess that feels like about 10 minutes. <laughs> Thank you, thank you very much, John. <laughs>